awesome to welcome Bellarmine University head coach Scott Davenport to share the game. Davenport's career record of 378 and 117 losses through the 2020-21 season ranks him as Bellarmine's all-time winningest coach, both in terms of total wins and winning percentage of over 76%. In the 2020-21 season, Davenport guided the Knights to a highly successful transition as an NCAA Division I school. Bellarmine sported a 14-8 record overall and earned an invitation to national postseason tournament and following one game short of capturing the A-Sun Conference regular season crown. At the Division II level, Davenport experienced nearly unequaled success, winning a national championship in 2011. Coach Davenport, welcome to the podcast. I'm the luckiest guy to be here. Trust me. I'm going to have more fun if anybody watches this. Well, that's great, Coach. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you. I mean, you've been on my list for a long time. And, uh, you know, one of those reasons, one of the reasons is, is this focus on the pass. And when you watch your teams play, you can tell that that is something that is coached, that is something that's emphasized, and that's something that's bought into. So maybe let's just start with the basic philosophy of your pass heavy offense. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're going to go way back. You know, I, I coached high school. Um, for, for everyone watching this, I was a head, I coached high school basketball for 15 years, 10 years as a head coach. Um, and so I relate very, very close to those high school coaches. I, I've been a college coach for 27 years and we'll, we'll start right there. The last 15 years I've been the head coach of Bellarmine university because that's the key in this journey. So as a graduate assistant, as a full-time assistant, I spent 11 years under two Hall of Fame coaches, Coach Crum and Coach Patino. Well, they are the two of the greatest pressing coaches in the history of the game. And you say, well, how does that relate to passing? Well, when I was a head high school coach at Ballard, when I was a JV coach at Ballard here in Louisville, I pressed, I mean, we pressed on missed shots just so we could, let's say if we scored on 50% of our possessions, we doubled our amount of pressing opportunities. But I had Allen Houston, an NBA All-Pro. I had, you know, 10 Division I players in 20, excuse me, 28 Division I players in 10 years. So we were good. We pressed you. Under Coach Crum, under Coach Patino, well, 16 years ago, I'm named the head coach at Bellarmine. They had won nine games, and it took about one session of individual instruction with each of the returning players, and I was like, who are we going to press? I mean, it was impossible. The schools were different. The makeup of the rosters were different. And what happened over time is I applied what I learned from Coach Patino and Coach Crum, and this was the biggest lesson. Both those great coaches in their pressing philosophy, they only had one goal, and that was to make you uncomfortable to where they could speed you up and you'd make a mistake. Now, they did it different ways. Coach Crum did it through a, a lot of a zone press look that he got from Coach Wooden with a lot of man principles. Coach Patino wanted to deny your point guard and make other guys speed up and make mistakes. Uh, but it was just the whole theory was I'm going to speed you up, make a mistake. And what evolved at Bellarmine, let's do that on offense. Let's press on offense. Now, 2021, Coach Patino, to get those guys to press in line to in line, 94 feet with everything they got, that's tough to do. Press on offense in 2021, they like doing that. Because I get to press with the ball versus chasing the ball. So how do you press on offense? Well, well that's the question we're going to ask, Coach. So let's go. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, it's interesting. You press on offense by making the defense uncomfortable and you speed them up. Well, how do you do that, Coach? You don't do that dribble. You do that off the pass because when you move the ball, you move the defense. I do not have players, but we've had a, a, a couple, maybe five, 
But basically, our roster cannot go by you one-on-one. And that's the way a lot of the game's predicated right now. But if I get you closing 15 feet out to me, my chances of being able to go by you now is pretty good. Because if you don't get out there, I'm going to shoot. So when you race out there and I go by you, now it's five on four and the chase is on. Okay. We chart, and, and I, and I want to, you know, I, I want – this to be perfectly clear. Here's what we chart during the game. We chart ball reversals. Now, the last 10 years, we were division two. We led all of division two basketball in field goal percentage, six of the 10 years. One of those years we led the world because I checked all three levels of NCAA, JUCO, NAI, and the Euro League. And I said, we led the world. Okay. We were in the top four, 10 out of 11 years in field goal percentage. So I want to interject the challenge last year. Now we're a division one team. We're transitioned. We're going to find out if this will work. I had already come to grips that I was going to go to my grave never having been a division one head coach and our president, Dr. Susan Donovan had a vision and here we are. And, you know, at the end of that year for us to play a great Liberty team on national TV for a conference championship, when we were picked last, the players deserve and this staff deserve so much credit. But so last year, the, the 10 out of 11 top four, six out of 10 top number one in the nation division two. So last year is a great challenge. 358 teams playing. Number one, Gonzaga. Not too hard to figure. They were 37-0 going into the national championship game. We were three. We were number three in the nation of 358 teams. Why? Passing. I do radio. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. no, this is great. Uh, so so I just want to throw something out there because it's it's phenomenal. I am watching your team, the success and the numbers are great. And I would argue maybe your greatest challenge is to stay and adhere to the system, because in talking to some other coaches, Joe Gallo, Rick Croix, um, John Towers going through it this year, transitioning to Division One opens up potentially different types of players. But you will continue to be successful if you stick to the players that you want rather than the ones you can get, right? Yes, Chris. We, we had three days, three long days of meetings in April at the conclusion of our season. You know, we would meet early. Everybody would go for long runs. Uh, we would do, you know, our work. We'd meet again. And then, you know, sometimes in the evening we'd meet again. And we kind of – your point is well taken because – as everybody was zigging over here, we were going to zag over there. And we decided we were going to get players who, first of all, love being at Bellarmine. When I say love being at Bellarmine, not just the, 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 the university, the community, they loved everything about it. But let's face it, they're here because they love play basketball. Well, they love the way we play. And two, we wanted players who, who absolutely love who they're playing with. And the third part of that equation uh, it's kind of, you know, two parts, guys who wanted to be coached the way we're coaching the game. And they, guys, we want to coach to play the way we play. Now, let me qualify everything I, I say. The first lesson you ever learn in coaching is there's more than one way to be successful. There is no one way. And you mentioned another coach. It's, it's, but it works for us. Mm -hmm. And then we believe in it and we think it's a fun way to play. What we chart during a game, and I'm a big Greg Popovich fan. He was a Division Three coach. The way that the, way the, uh, uh, the Spurs play, uh, they were on that great run. I kind of got obsessed with studying them and uh, watching them and really understand it. But this past year, we're third in the nation in shooting percentage. When we and we chart every game with no ball reversals. In other words, ball comes down, throw to the right side, and it never got reversed. We shot 
with only one ball reversal. It got back to the top. It went from right side to left side. We shot 52 full. With two plus ball reversals. Ball got reversed a minimum of twice. We shot 63.4%. Why? You move the ball, you move the defense, and you try to speed them up to making a mistake. Now, it takes incredibly self, unselfish players willing to give themselves up for each other by a hard scoring cut to the rim. That third man is so occupied. Oh, he's cutting the score. That now maybe in a bad closeout, the help's not there. And maybe, maybe we get in the lane or get in the box, as we called it, and we get it inside out. We attack inside out three ways, off the dribble, off the pass, or off an offensive rebound. And we practice it. Now, let's go back to Coach Crum and Coach Patino. They are incredibly first-class individuals. They're Hall of Famers for a reason. If they came to Bellarmine's practice that we had this morning, they're too nice. They would have never said this to my face. They would have got to their car, and they would have laughed and said, I can't believe he runs those drills. <laughs> they would have. No, they're too nice to guys. Well, they, give us an example. What type of drills, Coach? A basic fundamental two-man, three-man, four-man, five-man passing drill. Yeah. On time, on target, make my teammate look good. What we call a college pass, not one floated, not one-handed, not off target. Make my teammate look good. But it works for us. It's a fundamental. I do radio 52 weeks a year. Last year. A lot of things going on in college basketball. People were calling me and uh, Kentucky fans were upset. We can't shoot. We don't. And I'm like, you can't tell me that Coach Calipari has been, you know, another Hall of Fame coach, has players that can't shoot. It was shot selection. Yeah. You can't tell me those kids, those McDonald's All-Americans, you put them in the gym, they can't shoot. Okay, what leads to shot selection? Pass it. And it's that. That I'm going to use the word program because by my definition, that means you have a plan, a plan to get the best shot, not just a shot. Yeah, I got this shot. I'm open. Oh, no, one more and I got the best shot. And that equates to our shooting percentage. Um, just and, just and, before yeah. you go on, coach, I've got to say this because you you add validity to this comment that I make where coaches think I'm crazy. I say it this way. I say the decision is more important than the skill. Not that the skill isn't important, but the decision. And that applies to shot, shot selection. selection. You're right. Like anything else. If you take good shots, you shoot good percentages, right? Yes. But the best shooters can't make bad shots. Exactly. You go through history. No. The best shooters. I, I, I can really date myself. The, the, the Rick Mounts, the, the Paul Pierces, go through the greatest shooters we've all seen. He's short of the big guys, the Kareem Jabars, the Shaquilles. That, yeah. That's a different shot. They're dunking the ball. Yeah. It was shot selection. I mean, I don't think Paul Pierce, he, he's a great shooter, but he took great shots. And he was a great teammate. And I can go way back through the annals of, of, of basketball at all levels. But I'm going to give you an example. You know, am I, am I, am I a basketball nut? Um, yeah been probably called a lot worse my my mother right before she passed away 11 years ago she said you know if you uh if you really work hard you might get a real job make something out of yourself <laughs> you're still trying I don't think of it again work out. I don't think I'm ever, well that job would be a vocation yeah and I think we've had a you know I've had an advocation but this past and two years ago not not last year the NBA now the granted the shot clock's 24 seconds the NBA had 2.78 passes per possession. Now, I granted, that's out of respect. Those are the greatest athletes on the world. I think they're greater athletes than NFL players or NBA, excuse me, of MLB. I think they're greater athletes than, than the NHL. I think the NBA of only 360 active are the greatest athletes 
because of the skill involved in the world of sports. The NCAA, again, it's 2.78. Let's get to the NCAA. 3.48 passes per possession. Now, with a 30-second shot clock, that tells you there's either quick shots or a lot of dribbling. Only 3.48 passes in, in a shot clock. Go ahead. Ask. Well, I'm just going to I'm going to counter that, but not to be divergent because I really believe in the way you play, but more so that that there's been coaches on this podcast and certainly coaches I've talked to that do think ball reversals are overrated. The reason being because sometimes you can just create an advantage off the dribble. And if you create an advantage, you're scoring or drawing two. But that's not everyone. And that's where you come back to not everyone has those players. And that might be why the difference from the NC, you know, from the NBA to some levels, but especially to your yes. level. Your no, goal is to absolutely. create an advantage, right? 100%. Yeah. You're just but doing it I, differently. Well, but you're right. But the one thing that will never change, in my opinion, and I don't think it's ever changed. I don't think it ever will change is in the game of basketball at all levels, you know, very seldom, sometimes it's hard to say never, but very seldom, if ever, do the five best players make the best team. Agreed. At all levels. And you go back through the annals of basketball and you can see that. Um, well, Coach, so let's go I, back to those stats. So the NBA yes, is 2, 2. Two points per possession. 2.78 in the NBA, yeah. 3.48 in the NCAA, Bellerman 5.1. Passes per possession. So what is our objective? Move the ball, move the defense. Okay, where do we want to move the ball? Not just reverse it, because they'll just match with you and watch you pass the ball, take a bad shot. No, we then the next thing that we chart, is what is our shooting percentage when it goes inside out or it just lays on the perimeter? And it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. Uh, you know, we want to force the defense to guard a big court. You know, I, I was a walk-on TV player at the University of Lord. Now, that's not a very prolific basketball playing backward and let's let's go to the argument of michael jordan being the greatest ever if you put michael jordan in a closet i could guard michael jordan in a closet i mean yeah it's a closet so we don't play in a closet we want to open the court have full court 94 feet we never stop running out of the wing never because the court would get smaller. If a player ran free throw line extended, like a lot of players do, and he stopped and held his hand up and said, throw me the ball. Well, as the ball advances, the court would get smaller. The defense would have to defend a very small area. Well, what if that wing player runs all the way through, through the rim? He either gets a layup or the defense has to follow him, but the court gets bigger. Now, ball reversals forces the court 50 feet wide. If it gets stuck on the right side and that defense only has to guard 16 to 18 feet from the ball, excuse me, from where the ball is to the sideline, it's pretty easy to guard. But if I got a player sideline to sideline and that court's 50 feet and we utilize 50 feet, we're difficult to guard. And we don't. Now, Everybody thinks we shoot all these threes. When we were Division Two, we were seventh out of 14 in the GLBC and threes attempted. We don't. We don't. That was one of my questions, Coach, because, again, when I looked up the numbers, I was surprised that this was not a three-point shooting offense as much as I would have thought. Uh, well, you're right. And, and, see, you looked it up. It, it surprises people. Yeah. But, again, we're – there's not, there are games we shoot a lot of threes, but that comes down to taking what the defense allows and being a balanced team inside out, sideline to sideline. Yeah, we'll shoot threes. We practice them constantly. 
but we're not a one-dimensional team. I think one of the keys is we spend a lot of time reading the defense, not the offense. Now, I, I, I'm going to go, like, for example, you know, some teams defend the ball differently. Some teams slap down. Some teams double down. And we try to be very skilled in reading the defense, not the offense. Coach Patino one time, I'll never forget, you know, he, he'd been in Kentucky, he went to the Boston Celtics, and he came back to Louisville, and I was retained on his staff. And at that time, uh, well, now, I was the first person he ever retained from a previous staff ever. It's one of the greatest compliments I'll ever get. And I'll never forget one time he asked me, in doing the preparation for a Kentucky game, what was the most difficult thing about playing Kentucky under Rick Pitino? And I told him, I said, Coach, I, it's a funny story, Chris, and if you don't think I'm nuts, this will totally, this totally remove all doubt. I was driving home one night. It was, about, it was during a Kentucky game. I was coaching at Louisville. He's at, Louis, at Kentucky. I, I'm at Louisville. And I'm driving home, and I, I turn the radio on to listen to the play-by-play -play of the game just to get to school. And I heard Coach Pitino going, zipper, zipper. I mean, it was like he was on my radio. And I drive along and I hear thumb up, thumb up. And, and, and I'm like, my Lord, I sit in the driveway underneath out of bounds. And he's like, fist down. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, I've struck gold. I sit with legal pad and I would listen to the games on the radio because their play by play and color radio guys were right next to his bench in Rupp Arena and they had a crowd mic taped on the scores tape to pick up crowd noise. Well, he's up and down the sideline. He's very active. I heard every call. So as I wrote down the scores 10 to 8, and he just ran thumb up, all I had to do was go to the video, the scores 10 to 8, and I knew every play call. He said, you've lost your mind. I said, no, I'm not. But So I knew all that. Why did we have a hard time beating him? Because when it broke down, his players knew how to read the defense, not the offense. Somebody made a mistake. We took him out of something. There was a guy in the corner just waiting, and his hands were – hand speed and body were ready to shoot it, and the ball went there, and we couldn't, we couldn't scout that. So I told him that. He said, number one, you have no life. If you were charting radio calls and then transferring it to a video, you've lost your mind. I said, Coach, it's Louisville, Kentucky. That's what you're supposed to do. And – but my point was how we have a, a great maintenance staff facilities team here at Pelham. I could go back there and get Dale Mills and Tommy Miller and Jeremy Doyle. I could get their team and teach them to run our transition game. I could. I'm arrogant enough as a teacher I could. But I'll tell you this one thing. They can't play a lick of basketball. <laughs> so you don't just teach plays. You teach people, especially when it's in an era of a shot clock how to become a basketball player. That player's coming at me. I've got a space to that corner. The man's driving the lane. I got to work behind his head on the baseline, not in front of him. So we, we emphasize teaching to read the defense and to be a basketball player, not a robot. Because the game, it's not a perfectly wrapped package where A throws it to B, throws it to C and D. It's just not. It's a very chaotic game. Now, that being said, and I'll invite everybody right now to come to any practice at any time. We try to practice at a very, very frantic pace. We do. Go ahead. I'm sorry you were going to ask something. No, this is great. I mean, I got lots of questions, Coach, but uh, I love hearing the stories and the connection to the offense and the style of play. But to just to bring people back, so the goal here is to pass the ball so fast that the defense has to work faster than they're normally accustomed, accustomed to yes. and that eventually they'll make a mistake. That's yes. the goal. Now you balance that and people might think this is just pure motion, but you also run sets and then play after the play type stuff and motion. That's kind of the blend of it. Is it? We do on a dead ball on a free throw out of a timeout. We will try to expose things. Yes, we do. Yeah. But what are we going to do if it breaks down? They're all five going to look over and say, now what? No, you gotta be a basketball player. You got to be a basketball player. I, I, I'll, I'm going to interject right now a drill that literally every day, 
Now, there's variations, but literally every day, game day, 10 o'clock walkthrough for a 7 o'clock tip to September 22nd, every day, we will go some form of five on four. Because we're trying to get you in a situation where through a bad closeout, we get you in a five on four scramble situation. We're going to expose it. Now, out of that, we got better defensively because we get we're not the most athletic. We get beat. All right. What happens when we get beat? We're down a man, right? So we better get good at being a man down. So we play a lot of five on four basketball. Now, again, we have a lot of variations. I won't go through those. It might be five on four, no dribble. So I want to get into those a little bit because I want to hear some of the constraints you play with. Because sometimes, again, that's the magic. It's not five on four. It's the magic of the constraints that you put on your players. So no dribble yes, is one it, example. It, it might be, it might be, we might teach a free, we might teach a four on four, just a war rebounding block out. But to reward the defensive team, we might go out five on four. At the other end, they get an extra, they get an additional player because we want to rotate people back. So it, it's, it's a lot of variations uh, that we build up to it, but we do it all the time, five on four, no dribbles, five on four live. Let's go four on four. Let's free throw. Let's free throw. Let's block out war rebound and go out five on four. Again, because we want the game to be played all 94 feet and all 50 feet. You know, and, and here's the, the, the ultimate objective. NBA all the way down to junior high basketball. When you have to take the ball out of bounds, it's harder to score. If you, where we've improved here is we've become a better defensive team and a lot of pride on defense and defensive rebounding. It's where we can get the ball down without having to take it out of bounds. Well, the first way you do that is rebound the ball. Let's do the math. If we, I, I gave all the numbers on our shooting percentage where well, you can lead the nation in shooting, you better get more shots than them. If you do, Short of something crazy happening at the free throw line or from the three-point line, I like my chances. Coach Wood, years and years ago, did an exhaustive study on the biggest determining factor in basketball. It wasn't rebounding. It wasn't your defense field goal percentage. It was offensive field goal percentage, and that has stuck with my whole life. I was shaped at an early age. How I got there from – to pressing coaches, to pressing on offense has changed. Now, we teach playing defense together just like everybody in Louisville. A lot of people say, man, Bellarmine plays unselfish. They pass the ball. Well, you know, every time we score, they get the ball. They don't let you play make it, take it like in a park game. Yeah. So now, four years ago, four years ago, we made a commitment that we were going to learn to defend together. Okay. Chris, in a five on four scramble setting, who you guard? If you're on defense, who do you have? Well, I'm either guarding the ball or I'm guarding two basically is how it works. Well, you have nobody, do you? Yeah. <laughs> it's five on four. You, yeah. I do this with camp with our little kids in camp. I'll put them in a five on four scramble setting. And invariably I'll, I'll ask the 10 year old who you have. I got him. Well, no, you don't. It's five on four. You only going to guard your man. Right. You better be guarding a man and a half. So we teach defense as a team, just like we do offense. Because ultimately, it's a team game. It is. Go back to my statement, very seldom, if ever, are the five best players in the team. Yeah. Fire and, away. And you've maximized that. Uh, Coach, so, um, you know, with that emphasis on the pass, uh, clearly a lot of the drills and a lot of the different things you do place an emphasis on the pass. That seems simple in and of itself, but the magic has to come with shot selection. So give us an idea how you're teaching shot selection. Cause it is sometimes, I think your exact quote was the end result is avoiding challenging shots to take challenge open. shots. Right. Okay. Our third component where we challenge every game is what is our shooting percentage of challenge shots? The NBA bigger sample size than anyone. Yep. And in the NBA, the greatest players in the world, just saying, that's 360 of the greatest players in the world. You know, five to six of their first round picks are going to be international players. 
So that's 360 of the greatest players in the world, and they shoot 18 and change of challenge shots. Best players in the world. So if a challenge shot at Bellarmine, you're not going to make it. So we don't want a challenge shot. And then the last part of the equation, we want the best shot that we practice. If one of our guys misses a great shot, it's the best shot, I'm going to stand over there and cheer for him. Do you think Chris Oliver's playing for me and he misses a, a, a wide open inside out three, he's one, two step, his hand speed and body rate. Do you think I think you woke up that morning trying to miss that shot? I love that okay. point, coach. I love that point. Let's go back and let's erase the mistake. The score is still 69, 69. Nothing's changed. Just erase it with hustle. And we'll come down and, and live to fight another day. So it does come down to shot selection. And that's being unselfish, recruiting the right guys, because that's where it starts. But, you know, if, if Chris, if you had a math class and you prepared day after day after day, and you went through problem after problem after problem and homework and preparation and study, uh, study groups, et cetera, when that teacher handed you that math test, would you be pretty confident? Yes, right? All right, you got that math test coming up on Thursday and you spent three weeks studying uh, U.S. history. Would you do very good on that test? No. So let's practice what we're going to do in a game. Now, are we a confident team? We should be because confidence comes from preparation. Always has. Always will. If I've studied math, bring me that math. Tell that teacher, come on, give me that test. I'm ready for that quiz. But if I spent two weeks studying U.S. history to take a math test, I'm, I'm scared to death. I'm not going to do very well. We make shots, we practice. Now, all right, there's outliers. You know, occasionally some guy has to throw one in. It happens. <laughs> but by and large, what we say in the huddle, you should expect to pat, make that pat shot because you practiced it. Our guys, they are dedicated. They love the game. And I'll interject right here. You show me somebody loves their job, and I'll show you somebody good at it. Show me the guy that hates to go to work every day. He's probably a miserable person, probably horrible at what he does. You know, caring is a very special talent, and we want guys that care. Coach, talk to me about the balance between catching to pass and catching to shoot. Because I find this is a huge problem at youth levels is yes. too many players are only catching the pass and then they never become an offensive player. They drop out of the sport because they never get to play offense. So that's a huge challenge at that level. So I'm wondering how you balance that for your players. The best passer is always to shoot. Why? Because the defense has to play it's going to make the pass easier. If I'm only playing the pass, the defense is going to play the pass. The best passer, like if I drive and I stop on two feet and I can elevate and shoot, I'm facing the rim in balance, or I, and I can pass, we don't teach the floater here. We don't. I mean, that's okay. You know, Kentucky, Coach Cal Perry does a great job of teaching the floater. We don't teach it. Because I jumping off two feet, I can shoot and I can pass. And I'm not going to get in a block charge situation where I've got to trust an official to make the hardest call in basketball, the block charge. So we play off two feet. Now, and there's other reasons, shooting in balance. I'm shooting at a stationary target. If I jump at 13 feet and I let go of the ball at 10 feet, the target didn't move, but I did. I moved a lot closer to the rim. Again, it's what works for us. Does a newcomer in your program struggle at first with passing too much and not looking for their offense because they want to fit in? Well, in recruiting, we have a saying, we want to recruit players who want to become us, not come into our program and he wants all of us to become him. That doesn't work very well. <laughs> I mean, it's happened. But again, that's the difference between culture. And it's okay to say that. It's the difference between culture and having a program because the program's having a plan. And the plan is this is the way we're going to play. 
But in that example I gave you, they are trying to be you. They just struggle with becoming you initially because, again, it's this balance between catching it to pass and catching. Right. Well, that's teaching. That's teaching. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm We're wondering teaching. then, how do you teach that? How are you developing that? Emphasis. Well, you, you, what else? Well, one, you stop a lot of practices. You take them aside. But I think the greatest way is in, in our program, you know, the greatest teaching always comes from within. Uh, go show me a third grade class with 22 third graders. And if, if 21 third graders went in there one day and said, man, I'm going to help all other ones. I'm going to help everybody in this room. That third grade teacher is going to have one heck of a day teaching third grade class. Well, what if I go into practice and I'm making a point, but uh, CJ Fleming, a five-year player in our program is, is got a player off making the same point or Dylan Penn or Ethan Claycomb. Now that teaching's coming from within and it'll speed up that teaching. You still have teaching. You do, it's different. But the teaching's coming not just from us constantly, but from within. You'd be amazed how fast they get it. Then success breeds success. They have success and they're like, man, I'm gonna do that again. You know, I take good shots and they go in, I'm gonna keep taking good shots. I take bad ones and my shooting percentage is 31 but I know I'm a better shooter than that. Well, I better take better shots. You talked about the passing drills, but I'm imagining that that is balanced a lot with you guys play a lot of offense versus defense to be able to develop this understanding. Is that correct? We, we, a lot of three on three, yeah. a lot of three on three, a lot of four on four, a, a lot of half court, a lot of transition, the transition offense. We never want to get sped up in a game. It's easier to slow down with a minute and a half to go and you're 10 ahead then if somebody speeds you up out of your comfort zone, we think we practice at an absolute breakneck tempo. We do. We do. Um, you know, players would rather condition with a ball in their hand and a very competitive, timed, uh, challenging drill than they would me over there, you know, reading off a clock and us running sprints. You know, 2021's basketball. It's different than 80s basketball. It's different. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. I understand that. You know, I've, I've changed a lot. Some things, non-negotiable. Taking bad shots, you know, being selfish, you know. And they know that. They understand. Well, and to clarify, your approach is very modern basketball. Uh, the analytic numbers and everything paint that picture. So I don't think anyone's sitting here thinking otherwise. But your methods are curious to some people because I think a lot of people aspire to do what you do, but they don't accomplish it with their players. Well, you have to believe in there's a right way and a wrong way to play the game. You know, I, one thing had changed. You either use a backboard or dump the ball. Finger rolls. I, I mean, it's okay. That doesn't work for us. You know, Coach Graham and Coach Patino – Talk, I, I'm asked a lot of times in a corporate talk, I'm asked, you know, what, how are they different? They're the exact same. They thought the game should be played the exact same way from a fundamental standpoint, but they taught it 180 degrees different. Coach Crump was a math major. He was very analytical. That 45 degree angle on the bank shot right above the block is perfect. The ball hitting that backboard. Coach Patino coached it. As a, as a passionate, high-strung Italian, going to challenge you for everything. But they taught the game. The, they thought the game should be played the same way. They taught it totally different. I have to be Scott Depp. I cannot be Danny Crum and Rick Pitino. So I want to come back and emphasize something, because uh, Rick Beard said this on the basketball podcast I did with him a long time ago, and it was exactly what you're saying, which is this concept of, shot selection and shooting high percentages, they simply don't allow their players to shoot any fadeaways at the rim. And that simply leads to higher percentage shots. And that's basically what you're saying about no floaters. Like we get to the rim, we're finishing off two feet. And if not, we're kicking it inside out. And we're going to shoot shots we practice. Yeah. And that means, I know that sounds simplistic. It does. But one of Coach Wooden's favorite sayings ever was, Forever, ever. You know, he said it's it's a game of simplicity and it's a game of repetition. 
Well, that's really what teaching is all about. Now, that's Coach Wood. That, you know, we're talking 80s basketball, simplicity and repetition. Hey, I'm not going to go down and reinvent the wheel now. Somebody a lot smarter than me would do that. But I am going to teach the way the game is successful for us so that our players are the best version of themselves. LeBron James is not walking down the ramp to practice a belt. <laughs> He's not. Not yet. I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, uh, talk to me about your, your rule that if you see help defenders' numbers, get the ball out of your hands. Yes. Again, read the defense, not the offense. Your offensive guy will be there for you. So soon as I put you in a scramble situation, our, our players, it, it, the ball's passed from A to B. Then C, D, and E, their mindset is where am I going to be a receiver? Now what we need is a passer. So they're thinking, and soon as B passes it, soon, excuse me, soon as A passes to B, he's thinking where am I going to be a receiver? So what happens when the ball is in the air, everybody in the gym, all four players are thinking, where are they going to be a receiver? And who does that put pressure on? The defense. So, so this is also, I mean, I phrase it this way, but you might have different phrasing, but your players cut to score. They're not cutting yes. to just empty space. They're cutting it, to it, score. It's cut with purpose. Your goal is to cut with purpose, cut to score, and, and probably the most important way we play, cut to get a teammate open. Because you know why? If I get you open and you score, what are you going to do for me? You're going to cut to score, and now you're going to get me open. If I drive, you, you talked about exploiting a, a, a missed defense. If I drive and I get you a shot, the next time you drive, I'm hoping you get me a shot versus put the ball in somebody's hand and let them dribble, 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 and say, get your own shot. We just, we don't have players like that. Yeah. We just don't. Yeah. The cut to score, the drive to score, the exact same thing, just a different yes. emphasis, the exact yes. same thing. Yes. Or draw two. Yes. And then I'm, I'm just curious about the part that goes with that, uh, which is when you cut to score, your emphasis seems to be you're trying to score more off the wings. Is that are those primarily the attack areas? I mean, it yes. was so impressive watching your cutting, but then it seemed like well, wings were the primary attack areas. Well, because we want the court defended 50 feet sideline to sideline. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly it. Well, how do you get them? You get guys on the wings. We don't want to be on the baseline. Why? The baseline becomes a defender. If I'm lifted, give me an example. Ball's on the right side of the floor. It's passed to the top. If I'm on the left side, what should I know is coming? The ball's coming to me. I'm going to lift, get it, and we teach our players that superior players, they drive to the middle of the floor. What's the middle of the floor do? It opens it up. If we drive baseline, that's where inferior players go. Why? The baseline becomes a defender. And they don't have, and, and that you're playing in a crowd. If I'm attacking full court pressure, the middle of the floor is my ally because they got to guard us everywhere. If I'm on the sideline against, and again, I, I coach for some good pressing coaches, let me get you on that sideline. Bad things are going to happen. That middle of the floor, the court wide open. Another thing that is noticeable, and you've already talked about inside out is that you will pass to cutters that don't just have a score advantage, but you'll also pass to cutters to create that inside-out advantage. And that seems to be where a lot of your guards are in post-up situations to be able to, again, score or draw two, right? Yes, because we want everybody in our team to be a basketball player. If I'm a guard and they guard me with a big guy, then i got to be able to go by them on the perimeter, take them outside. Conversely, I'm a really quick guard, and they say, well, I'm going to get a little guard up under him and get him. We're going to go inside because they are drilled on the same pulse moves, the same pulse presence, the same inside out mentality that are that bigs are. Uh, you know, we coach the game of basketball. And we if, if a player gets in an uncomfortable situation, that's our fault. That's my fault. 
you know, we don't, we don't segregate our players. Yeah. Big, small. And we we just want basketball. That it's very noticeable that you don't do that. It, it, it really does seem like your players in a system that emphasizes the pass have great freedom as well. Well, again, that's having a program by definition. That means you have a plan. And, and, you know, we take that to another level. We have a plan academically, athletically, socially. You know, it's a program. And uh, it's not very uh, It works for us. I, I mean, there's different ways. I understand that. I tell you this. I get to go to work every day. I don't wake up and feel that I have to go to work. And that's because of those players and this staff. I enjoy it. I really do. I mean, it, you know. Our practices may go by very, very fast because nobody's looking at a clock. I mean, we're going to compete and they're going to give it to each other when somebody beats you. And, you know, and we change lineups all the time. And um, I, again, show me somebody loves going to work every day. I'm probably going to show you somebody pretty good at what they do. What, what is something unexpected maybe for us as coaches that we wouldn't expect that you guys spend a lot of time on, but maybe you do? Free throw blockouts. I heard that. I'm Jay right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's why. If, if we spend two minutes, two, two minutes on a free throw blockout, offensive and defensive side up, right? My goal, and I tell them, um, 23 seconds to go. We're up three. And the opponent misses a free throw. We fail to block out. They tip it out. They kick it out, hit a three. It's tied. We get beat in overtime in the championship. How's that player miss that free throw block out on the field? It's crushed. He's crushed for the next eight months. He's crushed. That's my fault. Love it. It's four against two. The free throw shooter can't get in until the ball hits. We practice. Now, I, I, you, we, there's a lot of crazy things that we do like that. But you asked for an example, and that came to me right away. So if we say two minutes, free throw block out. What message am I sending? Least coaches think that you're just passing for passing sake, because I think that's sometimes how it's interpreted. It is. You are trying to score all the time. You're just going to not shoot it until you get the best shot for your team right. and your player. Right. right. And your players are educated and they understand that. It is. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's what teaching is. Um, you know, a practice plan to me is no different than when I taught high school, a lesson plan. It's no different. What's my objective? How are we going to teach it? How are we going to reward them when they learn it? And I think the one thing we do really, really I'm proud of in this program is we push our players, I hope, harder than they've ever been pushed in their life. I do. You know, because they're in college. They should be pushed harder than they were in the sixth grade. They should be pushed harder than they were when they were on the freshman basketball team, they should be pushed hard. Well, that's fair. Only if you support them as much as they've ever been supported in your life, in their life, outside of their parents. So we support them and they know that. That's fair. From reading so about every, you to clarify, coach, when you talk about pushed hard, the things I've read about you, what you mean is being honest with them. You're not talking about throwing balls at their head. You're talking about being honest and challenging them to be better, right? Uh, yes. Here's the difference, Chris. Every single player. Am I? Do you think I'm a very animated, passionate coach? Yes. Yep. I'm not going to apologize for caring. But here's their question. And ask them to a man. Am I doing it to them? Or am I doing it for them? Oh, they don't like the delivery. I can take. They don't, but they are, the moment they think everything I do is to them instead of for them, I can't coach them. Can't coach them. Big difference. That was Pat Riley. 
that's totally stolen from Pat Rob. He said, I just trade him. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if a player, if a player, you know, fails to execute a jump stop and, and, and we had drilled or whatever and I get all over him, hey, as long as he thinks I'm doing that to make him the best he can be, we're okay. I don't take it personal. He didn't wake up and say, I'm going to go in there and, and leave two feet in charge just to make Coach Steve mad. That doesn't happen. They're not trying to do that, yes. No. You know, I, I mean, again, caring is a special talent. It really is. You know, if everybody in this world really, really cared, we, we, it'd answer a lot of problems. It would. Coach, I, I mean, there's there's a few things that I want to wrap up with. And uh, one is, do your players value these possessions, the high assist rate, uh, the multiple passes per possession? I'm imagining now this has become something within your program that they value as much as the dunk or a great play. If, if, if you were if you if you had to face those charts and those numbers constantly, you would do. But they also understand it works for us. And, and, you know, last year we transitioned division one. I think we were, um, we were 0 and 22 in warmups. I think we lost every warmups, the dunk contest and warmups. We got annihilated. We, we, you know, we, we weren't very good. We had guys, we're playing teams trying to rip the back, the rim out of the backboard. Um, uh, but then we try to make it a basketball game. Yes, we are who we are. It's okay. We're all right. Uh, we, we respect everyone. We respect everyone. We do. Yeah. I think the reason our players respect the game, they have a lot of respect to the game, and they respect the hard work that, that it takes. Because our goal, in reality, I, I referenced a couple of times the 360 NBA players. In reality, I've got five freshmen right now. I, I'm not being – I don't want to be downer here, but I want to be honest and sincere. Those five freshmen are going to work past the year 2065. In some form or fashion, they're going to be contributing to their family, to their society, past the year 2065. Let that set – just do the math amazing it is it's it's humbling and and today as we doing this i've got one granddaughter she's turns three today our players they need her i mean she needs our players i'm not the answer i'm not but those 18 to 22 year olds in that locker room we need them we need them to be great in in all facets yeah, I need to be a great basketball player. I need to be a great student. I need to be a great leader, a great contributor. I need them. That little three-year-old that we have that's, that's three, that little granddaughter. I'm not the answer. I'm going to spoil her with everything she asked Popsy for. She's getting. But our players are the answer for her, not me. That's such and a we great point. We, oh. we take that obligation very serious. And the day we don't, Scott Davenport will walk out of this building. I tell the players, we have a ramp that leads from where our office is to the court. I said, you see me just run up that ramp one day, you know, the day that I'm not putting them first and that, that I'm not counting on them to, to teach them to go forward, I'll run out of the building. That day, I don't think the device to create that day's been invented yet. Not yet maybe as we wrap up coach I'm just a curious question what was maybe the most unexpected thing with the transition to division one that you faced well let's transition I mean weird year with COVID and all that too yeah let's just transition let's skip to that. a worldwide pandemic too <laughs> yeah let's skip that <laughs> yeah no you know what I, I, I'll give you this story where it started um, a couple here in Louisville Dr. Mark and Cindy Lynn made an unbelievable contribution uh, to redo, to renovate our entire locker room facility. There, there's a, a beautiful 20 seat video area. There's a reception area. 
where you can host the guests, et cetera. The, the, the players uh, dressing area, when we have the lockers put in, the USB ports, the, the chargers, the, they had everything. I went home that day and my wife asked me, how are the lockers? And I shook my head and she said, I thought they were great. And I said, when you and I got married, we'd have called that locker a condo, condominium. I mean, it had everything, a, a refueling area for everything. Well, so our players were sent home a week before final exams in April of 2020. They were robbed of the 12th straight uh, NCAA appearance. That was the third longest in the history of Division II basketball. It was the longest streak in the country, and it ended as we were having a team meal during spring break. They never got to take a jersey off for the last time, those four seniors. They were sent home. They came back on July the 5th. So that's our first concrete meeting. And again, I never, you know, I had accepted my life would end never being a Division I head coach. And now I'm in this meeting. And I've got this unbelievable locker room facility. Unbelievable. My first meeting ever. Division I head coach. Coach my whole life. You know where it was? I met him in the parking lot. And they were allowed to stand next to their car. And I had to tell them where they go get tested off campus. Oh, wow. So their resiliency will be something I'll never forget and I'll never fail to appreciate. And it's taught me so much. So really, there wasn't just one thing that was difficult. Everything was difficult. New cities, new travel, uh, new facilities you're playing in, different hotels, uh, everything. And um, they, uh, you know, I, I get emotional because um, they had so many first. And, and I'll, I'll cite one as, as we close. We won our first Division I game in the history of the institution. We lost at Duke. That was our first game. You know, if we're going to open it up during a worldwide pandemic, let's just do it at Cameron Indoor Stadium against the all-time winningest coach in the history of the game. Let's just do that, too. Brilliant. Brilliant scheduling. <laughs> and, and then we, we go up to Howard University, and we, we win the game. And, you know, if you were 18 to 22 years old, and you just won the first Division I game in the history of the school, can you imagine your celebration? We, you're going to race to that locker room, and, and you're just going to have that. We were not allowed to go to the locker room because we had to, it was a shared stairwell and Howard University had to go first because of COVID. They had to go first because it was closer to their locker room. We had to go second because we had, we had to go the furthest. We couldn't interact. Contract tracing. Our players couldn't wait. They grabbed the game ball. Who do you think they gave it to? It's the first Division I win in the history of the school on the road, what they do with the game ball? Who do you, they couldn't wait to the locker room. They did it on the court. Now you think who, 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 okay. The lead score of the game. Uh, maybe some guy drew three charges. Uh, maybe we, we had two seniors. Who would you give it to? I'm imagining you. <laughs> no, they gave it to our head athletic trainer, Brad Bluestone. Nice. He didn't sign up for COVID, testing guys at seven in the morning, four times a week. See, if everybody in society celebrated others, we'd be a lot better off. And they gave the ball to our head trainer. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. I'll, I, I'll That's never awesome. forget. I'll never forget. It. It, it's incredible. That's, That's people that value the service of other people. That's awesome. That's, That's right. And, it's, you know, good players play the game. Now they shoot a high percentage. They score a lot of points. They block shots. They defend great percentages, assist turnovers. That's what good players do. Extraordinary players make others better. What if everybody in that locker room, go back to that third grade class I mentioned, is trying to make others better. It won't be a good class. That won't be a good locker room. It'll be extraordinary. Coach, this has been awesome. You've made many, many more fans that didn't even know about your program and your success. Well, who you Chris, are, Chris. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to bear it all, and I, I don't want to. I can't. I'm, I don't want to turn my camera thing here. So my legal <laughs> pad on my desk 
which is updated daily. Then if the page is ripped off, I keep every old page. Then I but I put all the things on the very second line behind upcoming players' birthdays. We still get a cookie cake in the locker room. We kind of do things old fashioned. Is Chris Oliver? <laughs> Those, I it's on my second line below players' birthdays, and the reason. Because I use you as a resource constantly. It's right there on my legal pad, right, right below what my camera's on right now. You just gotta trust me, it is. But it, so I thank you very much. I'm honored, coach. Thank you.